Good afternoon. This is Ann Cross and welcome to A Glorious Experience. And I'm very excited today because I have a very special friend and sister in Christ who is here with me, none other than Nancy Mead. Hi, Nancy. How are you? I'm good today. How are you? I am blessed by the best. <laughs> I'm excited about this interview. Good. I feel honored to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, Nancy, I have known you, uh, I guess, now for a few years, maybe three, four, yep. three, four years. Just after COVID started, I so think our daughter came here and right. we got to know you through her. Uh huh. So about four years then. Wow. Time flies, doesn't it? It does. No, it Definitely does. so. Definitely. So um, I know that you, you and your husband, John, are uh, a part of our healing team from the standpoint that you you come and you you share your heart, um, your experiences, your testimonies. And the last particular um, healing school that we had, you actually shared some things and it really, really uh, blessed my heart. Now I know you have you have shared from time to time different things coming up. So what I would like to do is to start out uh, first of all, where are you from? Where are you from? Um, I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, in the suburbs, mm -hmm. and in a house that my dad built. Okay. We had um, I was the youngest of three, and um, you know, my we were Lithuanian, and my grandparents lived next door with my uncle. Oh wow, wow. Okay, that's I, and I didn't know that. So I'm I'm learning <laughs> tidbits as I go. That's right. Okay. So, uh, so how was life growing up as a child, as a young person? Well, um, when I was six and a half, my sister got sick and she passed away. So that was pretty at a pretty young age. And mm -hmm. Don't remember much before that except you know that we we fought like siblings. Mm -hmm. She was a little. She was older. She was older. She was eight, and I was six and a half mm -hmm. when she passed. Wow. No. So that was a little bit traumatic. Yeah, and I would then, say. Then, um, you know, people would say, well, I hope that your mom will have another baby. And she did. She got pregnant again and mm -hmm. she delivered a baby boy, my brother Dave. Mm -hmm. And then shortly after that, about a year later, when my brother was just one year old, my dad took his own life. Mm. So it, my childhood was a roller coaster up wow. and down. You know, I mean, how did you times. deal with that? Well, the only way I could deal with it, because my mom didn't believe in therapy, you know, didn't take us to therapy, and now that we didn't have my dad's income, we couldn't afford it, mm -hmm. so we, well, I just talked to Jesus. I cried myself to sleep every night. So you had Jesus in your heart. Yeah. You, so you, you were a young child, and you knew Jesus. Yeah, you know, we grew up going to church every Sunday, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, loved, I loved Jesus. Amen. Amen. He was a good therapist. He, He's the he best. Somehow got me to sleep and got through through that time. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, so you're you're originally from Maryland, yes. and um, I'm I'm assuming, and I don't know, did you marry while you were in Maryland, or did you marry when you came here? No. Um, John and I met when I was sixteen. We were sixteen, and. Um, and so we dated for five years, and then we got married in, wow. in Maryland. Wow. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so y'all got married. You were sixteen yes. when you started dating, and then you you dated for five years, and you got married. Okay. All right then. So, when did you move here? You um, we didn't move here till much later in our life. Our, my husband's job took us various places. First, we moved to Florida, from oh, Maryland, okay. and, and Alicia was born in, in Florida. Uh huh. And then after about three years, we moved back to Maryland and our son was born. And then John's company moved us to California. Oh, okay. And we were there about three years and, and for an earthquake. And <laughs> that was <laughs> too exciting. <laughs> oh, okay. So it's time to leave after yeah. that, huh? <laughs> so, yeah, that's right. So we moved back to Maryland again. And, and um, that's where we stayed for about 21 years. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, Alicia had gone off to college and she had chosen Vanderbilt. Okay. University, and that's where she met Haven. Mm -hmm. And um, so when they they got married down here, and we came down to the wedding here, mm -hmm. 
And then we went back to Maryland, and, and she told us that she was going to have a baby. She said, Tag, can you retire and come down here so Cora can see you grow up? Oh, Cora. So, I said so, that backwards. Yeah, so, we can see Cora <laughs> so, so you can see Cora grow up. <laughs> right. So, so y'all so moved here after that. Okay, so, from, so, so you got married in Maryland. So what was going on? Uh, you said John was, um, his job was kind of like taking him places. Right. Okay, so what was going on in your spiritual life? That's what we want to, to, to delve into. What was going on? Uh, because I know, you know, you're, you know, you had some traumatic things to happen in your childhood. Right. So how did you deal? I, I asked you before how you dealt with that. And you said Jesus was your therapist. Now, some people might not really understand what do you mean by that? Jesus being your therapist. Well, I, back then, it was more of a one-way relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, I would talk to him and just talk and talk until I fell asleep. Mm -hmm. And um, once in a while, I would feel his presence more, like in a time of danger. Mm -hmm. There was um, two instances when, um, well, first one was when my, my yellow bicycle was about to be stolen. I had mm -hmm. ridden it to the mall. And... As soon as I got to the mall and saw the bike rack, there was a, a paper bag under the bike rack, and I got this terrible feeling of danger mm -hmm. for my bike. Mm -hmm. But I thought, you know, I'm just being paranoid. I'll leave it here. And I went in and to the store, and I got my sewing notion, but I came back to check on my bike, mm -hmm. and it was fine. And so mm -hmm. I went to the next store and got my greeting card, and I mm -hmm. came back. I rushed back, and there was three boys there with wire cutters cutting chains off of people's bikes and then riding away with them. So I went out to the parking lot. I thought maybe I'd scare them away if somebody came out, but it, mm -hmm. they didn't scare. So I'm out in the parking lot and I'm just saying, Lord, what do I do? <laughs> My mother's going to kill me if this bike gets stolen. We can't afford another one. Mm -hmm. So I just felt this braveness come over me. And I went up and I said, excuse me, but that's my bike. <laughs> He was now working on my chain. Oh, so he was. So he had the thing getting ready to cut your chain. Yeah, I had stood out in the parking lot, watched him ride off with somebody else's bike. One of them, uh -huh. and then the other two started working on my chain. So I said, mm -hmm. "I got to act now. Uh -huh. I don't have time to get a security guard or anything." Right, right. So he, um, so I went up and I, you know, very shaky voice. I said, "Excuse me, but this is my bike." And they just said, "Oh, this is your bike," and they. They ran off, and then the security guard comes out and says, were there just some guys out here? <laughs> I said, yeah, they went that way. And wow. So I followed him because that was my way home anyway. Wow. So they just, so you came out, you were brave enough to say, hey, that's my bike. Oh, I just, just the power of God came over me, I guess. I didn't really credit it to God at the time, but now I give him the glory for that. Amen. And, you, you know, he might have had some angels right there. Right. Two around you, yeah, you know, protecting you as you were. Exactly, because they could have taken the wire cutters and hit me over the head with it, you know. But they looked intimidated, so they ran off. Praise God. That's awesome. That's awesome. So and then the next time was um, when Don and I were engaged to be married, and we had bought the house next door to his parents mm -hmm. in Catonsville. And so we had, um, I had gone to work, and it was trash day, left the the garbage cans out and when I came home um, I might be getting this mixed up because our house was broken into twice oh wow okay but anyway um our house was broken into and our wedding rings were were secured in a place in the house mm -hmm. and and when we came home that's right this was the time that was later at night we had I had gone to my mom's house mm-hmm Mm -hmm. John picked me up from work and drove me to my mom's house oh, for okay. dinner. Mm -hmm. And we were sitting at dinner, and so this feeling came over me again. And I said, Mom, we got to go home. You know, I didn't leave any lights on at home. And she says, oh, it'll be fine. It's just this one time. And I said, mm, I think we better go. Right. So we drove home, and we pulled the car in the garage, and the inside garage door was sitting open. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't think we'll let that open. And that cat comes out, and he was very antsy and, mm -hmm. and anxious. And so I said, John, I think we're going next door to his parents' house and call the police. Mm -hmm. So we did. And his father and John came back over to check because 
they still weren't convinced. They went around back and saw that the door had been jammed open and came back white as ghosts and said, yeah, call the police. So we called the police and, and they came. And But our wedding rings were still safe because wow. we came home at the exact time he was still in the house. Wow. This burglar. So the burglar was there. Because my jewelry was strewn down the stairways and out to the back door where he had broken in. And um, so, Wait, so, opening, so he was trying to steal your jewelry. Yeah, well, that's about all I had. You know, mm -hmm. we were you know, not married yet, so I uh -huh. didn't have many other valuables. Oh, okay. So I got okay. my high school ring and some mm -hmm. other jewelry. And uh, so when we opened the garage door, he heard that from upstairs when he ran down the steps. Wow. So, you so you blessed not so, to go in. So the Holy Spirit was leading you in both times, uh, basically to how, how to deal with the, the people that was trying to yeah. cut your bike. This perfect and also, timing. Yeah, yeah. To scare these people so maybe they wouldn't do it again and mm -hmm. to um, save our wedding rings. Wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. So in order... And, and, and I know that you have to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus and to have a growing uh, relationship for him to speak to you and not only for him to speak to you, but for you to hear and obey. Yeah. Well, this was just a feeling that came over me. I didn't hear his audible voice in my head. Okay. No, so just no a words, knowing? Just a, kind of like a you know, knowing? Just, yeah, the Holy Spirit just saying, danger, mm -hmm. danger. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, that's, that's, that's interesting. So, okay. Now what about the healing part, the things that you have gone through, the things that um, maybe that you would like to share in regards to things that you've walked through yourself in regards to healing or anything else that you would like to share in that regard? Well, when my, my sister and my dad both died so young, I knew you know, I had experience that people don't always live to a ripe old age, mm -hmm. you know, and so that made me very cautious and reserved. And I was already kind of a shy person, but then I was very, very introverted. Mm -hmm. You think that was, that was fear? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, I saw that God was not going to protect me. I felt like I had to protect myself. So mm -hmm. I, Put up walls around my heart, you know, so no one could hurt me, and, mm -hmm. and I didn't do anything dangerous. I was a very good kid. I didn't smoke or drink or feel invincible like most teenagers feel. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I didn't do any of that because I was afraid of the world and did you realize afraid of dying you young? Did you realize that you were doing that? Um, not really. No, I just felt like you know, the um promises in the Bible didn't seem real to me. Mm -hmm. I didn't, didn't experience you know, God's protection, so mm -hmm. I felt like I had to protect myself. Okay. I didn't have a dad to protect me anymore. Mm -hmm. The only choice I had till John came along and then he became my protector. He, be, he, he became your protector. Yeah. <laughs> How sweet. How sweet. So, so in, in that, uh, as you were talking about how, how you built that wall up, and, uh, you know, there's a scripture in the Bible where it talks about Job. And, um, and Job was saying that the thing that he feared the most came upon him as it related to his children, his, his family, and, and all of that. So fear basically had opened the door for those catastrophic things to come in and to, you know, basically for his, he, I mean, his children to die and, and all of everything else happened to him. So just thinking about what you just said, do you think that uh, that you built up a wall of fear there to allow some things to come in? Well, fear from the Bible is a spirit. Mm -hmm. So I guess you know, I did open the door to those fears. And, and mm -hmm. um, so I was even more distant from God because of that. So how did you deal with that? Um, well, I just kept praying. I just kept, kept praying to God, and he, he was wooing me. I could feel the you know, Holy Spirit just wooing me, and then I see these signs, you know, that, oh, he is real, he is alive. Mm -hmm. and so we just kept going to church and just being faithful through the, the valleys of the 
shadow mm-hmm. death. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, what really changed my life was, um, well, it wasn't until many years later when we were getting ready to move here. Okay. But I, um, I went to the library because all our stuff was packed up. We had sold our house and we were living in a, um, a condo, a rented condo. So we didn't have much to do. So I went to the library and got books. And I, I love stories about people who would um, nearly die and mm-hmm. experience maybe going to heaven mm-hmm. and they would write about their experiences. So I was looking for more books like that. Uh-huh. I'd already read a few and I picked up this book from the library shelf. I got that's my own copy of Joseph, Prince. Joseph oh, yeah. Prince's Unmerited Favor. Oh, yeah. That's and I thought, well, is that Donny Osmond? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, who, who is, is that? I didn't know <laughs> But I got a good, a good feeling about it, so I took it back to the condo and I started reading it. Uh-huh. And and of course, I was very cautious, you know, because the Bible says not to believe everything you read and right. hear, and to look out for false teachings. Right. But I compared it to the Word of God and not to what I had believed. Mm-hmm. You know, don't lean on your own understanding. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So as I was reading through it, and and He explains grace and righteousness in such a way that it just open my eyes to the truth that we are yeah. completely forgiven. Right. I read the sentence in, in this book that, that, that said, if the enemy can keep you believing the lie that you're not completely forgiven, mm-hmm. you'll be on an emotional seesaw. Mm-hmm. And I thought, that's my life. <laughs> you know, wow. Every different circumstance is good. You know, I'm high. Every bad circumstance, I, I mm-hmm. feel depressed. Mm-hmm. So I thought, yeah. Baby, I don't think I'm completely forgiven, mm-hmm. and and that my spirit just leaped for joy because I Praise just God. felt that truth. Right, right. I got on Facebook and I typed in, I just had a revelation. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to share it with everybody. <laughs> this joy that I felt right. of being completely forgiven. Right. I didn't have to keep track of my sins. Trying, and trying to them. do something to get into the exactly. good graces of God. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. that's dead works when you're right. trying to. Because you can't buy his favor. Right. It's free by the blood of Jesus mm-hmm. is what I learned. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, why didn't I know this earlier? This mm-hmm. is awesome. And so I got online and posted that and just got a few comments. Not a lot of people commented back. But, but, that, but you know, so many people uh, don't really know that. That's why God says that he says, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. Exactly. And, yes. and there are a lot of people even now that, try to do good works, uh, you know, to be forgiven. They try to do good works to be healed or for their father's love. When God, God, uh, John 3, 16 says, for he so loved the world. He so loved the world that he gave us his son. He gave his son. So our part is to just believe and receive and Mm -hmm. declare his word. Amen. Even when we don't see it happening in the world, we keep declaring his word. Amen. Amen. So so you had an eye-opening experience that you finally realized that God loves you uh, regardless of how you have performed, but that he just loves you, period, and his grace is sufficient for all things yes. and his favor, which that's, that's it. His favor is his free gift. Absolutely. Wasn't a cheap gift, but a free gift to you, to me and to everybody else. Right. So I'm sure that that did a work on the inside of you. Oh, yeah. um, did people recognize that as it? Well, the first thing I did was in this, um, you know, temporary condo we were in, I decided to give the first part of my day to the Lord. Mm-hmm. Somebody I was with in a Bible study told me that they were doing that. You know, they'd get up at 5 a.m. And, and, and pray and worship the Lord and then go to work. And you know, mm-hmm. I was like, well, you know, I got to get the kids to school. And I, right. I never did it. Uh-huh. But, but after, you know, reading that sentence in this book, then I thought, yeah, I'm going to do that. So and that was a big change in my life too because God just started showing up with all these coincidences. Uh-huh. Seemingly, huh? Like they were coincidences. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> God winks. Right, right. Yeah, but it, it just convinced me beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is real, He's alive, and He wants to be a part of our lives and He loves us. Yes, absolutely. And that, that is so powerful 
because up until that point, you were in bondage. You were in fear. Right. You're being tormented. Mm -hmm. But then you read this, this book. Mm -hmm. And 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 I know, I know you read the book. They were the words of Jesus in the book. And it spoke to your heart. Yes. I was seeing a therapist at the time because of depression with issues with our son. Mm -hmm. And when I read that sentence in the book, I said, I think I said it out loud. I said, I don't need a therapist. I just need more of Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> And so I got more of Joseph Prince's books, and I read all that I could get my hands on. Yes. I ordered it through Amazon and uh -huh. just started reading and reading and reading, and I was like, i got to tell everybody. Yes, yes. I love, I love Joseph Prince. I love the message of, of grace that, um, that he presents in su such a profound way. Right. Um, and it, it's, freeing people, you know, if you truly understand. Right. It's God's not a grace. grace that allows you to get, keep sinning right. intentionally. Right. You know, it's... it's Exactly. God's unmerited favor. That's it. That's it. And I and, and the the definition that God gave to me about his grace is that it is undeserved, over generous, preferential treatment to all of us. And uh, nothing that we did or could do, you know, to earn or to deserve it. But he just blessed us. And that grace empowers us to do his will. Right. But we need to stop trying to earn. Mm hmm. God's favor, because that is what is keeping people from receiving, mm -hmm. and that is why, because they're they're being putting themselves back into the old covenant of law, mm -hmm. and that is disqualifying them from receiving grace. That's right. That's why well, there's so much sickness in the church and diseases and and addictions and and divorce because people are still trying to earn God's grace mm -hmm. rather than just saying thank you, thank you, Jesus. Yes, lots of little ways that the enemy can trick us into oh, earning. Yeah. yeah, yeah, free gifts. So now, so you said that you had been dealing with depression over your son, right? Now, can you talk about any of that? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, it was two thousand and nine, at the end in, in November. Zach was away at college mm -hmm. in Virginia, and he went manic. Uh, how we knew was that we were getting texts from him in the middle of the night, so we knew he wasn't sleeping. Mm -hmm. And these texts became more and more erratic and, and didn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So we're like, um, I think he's on drugs. So John and I decided we'd have to drive down there and pull him out of school if mm -hmm. need be. So we, without telling him, drove down and and met him and. And he was, he was very manic. He was very talkative, which is not his personality. He's, right. very, he's usually a very quiet person. And he was just talking a mile a minute. And mm -hmm. so we thought, well, we're going to have to pull him out of school. So we pulled him out of school and took him home to Maryland and mm -hmm. put him in the hospital for a week. Mm -hmm. And that was very traumatic because he would say things like, my roommate's going to kill me. you got to get me out of here. And so we talked to the people that worked there, and they said, well, he doesn't even have a roommate. Mm -hmm. so, and he'd say, well, if you don't get me out of here, you're not my parents anymore. Pull all these mm -hmm. tricks to try to get us to just take him out of there. Mm -hmm. And so that you know, upset me so bad that I, John said, you better go to the doctors and get some help. And it, so, it affected your health. Yeah, so I got, went to the doctors and got put on, you know, I couldn't sleep. Mm -hmm. I got sleeping pills and antidepressants, mm -hmm. so I was taking all these medications and, until my doctor said, well, you know, long term, you're going to need something stronger. You need to go to a psychiatrist. So, so the next few months of our lives, we were going to his doctors, his psychiatrist, his therapists, and my doctors, and, and it was very stressful, and so... But Zach was diagnosed with um, a drug-induced bipolar disorder. So it, did, it came through the drugs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He had been trying drugs at, at school. And so he, one good thing that happened was that he, he said that he had an out-of-body experience when he tried this one drug and he thought he had died. And he, so he was a stayed away from that drug and just went and picked marijuana as his his drug. So he, he went back to smoking marijuana, though, after we brought him home and, and had him 
clean for a while. And, mm -hmm. and we, we felt like you know, we couldn't trust him anymore. Mm -hmm. so we'd try to take all our valuables. Oh, this is, he started selling all his possessions so he could get, buy more marijuana. Mm -hmm. And when he was out of his possessions, he started taking some of ours. Wow. Mm -hmm. So we, I was, you know, stressed about that. You know, is he, does he know that this knickknack is valuable? Or right. Is he going to sell it? Is right. He, should I take pictures of this <laughs> so I can prove that I had it? Mm -hmm. And so we started putting our valuables in our room, and we put a deadbolt on our bedroom door. Mm -hmm. And I'd have to lock it every morning, make sure I had the key, and, you know, where's my purse? Oh, is it upstairs? <laughs> you know, right. Is he going to, you know, steal the car? You know, it, was, it was just so stressful that... I ended up, one morning I woke up, three years later, I woke up and I just couldn't move. I was just paralyzed. And it was like, all I could move if somebody helped me. John came up and would help me out of bed. But So I, you know, I said to John, and, and these, these thoughts of, of suicide were coming. And so I told John, you know, I'm, I'm having thoughts of suicide. And he just said, oh... You won't do that because you know how bad it would make me feel. Then the next night, thoughts of homicide. You got to take him with you. You and you were getting all of these thoughts, yeah, mm -hmm. demonic thoughts. Right. Mm -hmm. So this morning when I woke up and I couldn't move, I said, "John, this is bad." And he said, "I know, but I'll take care of you." But to me, that meant you know more of the same. We're just gonna because <laughs> he always takes care of me. Mm -hmm. But so I reached for the phone and I dialed 911 and the police came and though they were very nice. They had to take me to the hospital in handcuffs and, and that just, you know, added insult to injury. So at the, um, at the hospital, um, I went through more catatonic occurrences and they just gave me more medicine and more therapy and the, mm -hmm. the doctor kind of insulted me saying well your husband you could live with your son and not be all apart so you know it must be your genetic makeup you know so but I, I still felt God with me even in mm -hmm. the hospital mm -hmm. you know, I would see little signs and one of the signs was the number one 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 Somebody, when I was bowling, had taught me that that was a, a bad number. And you should, you know, avoid that because it looks like a little outhouse if you put a roof over the three mm -hmm. ones. Mm -hmm. so, so I would see this 111, and I thought, oh, no, it's a bad number. But then, you know, I feel Holy Spirit saying, no, think of it as the Roman numeral three, like the Trinity. Right. You know, and when you see it, say, the Lord is with you. Mm -hmm. So I, I did. I started saying that. And, and then um, I noticed that my... My friend from church, her name was Sherry, she was coming to visit me. And it occurred to me that God had gone before me, before he knew that I would need her and, and helped us to be friends. Because when we were in church, she sat next to me in the choir and she and I drew her name for the Secret Santa mm -hmm. game. And, and the Holy Spirit just gave me all these ideas for little gifts for her. Because mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not a good shopper and I, <laughs> I don't like shopping. <laughs> But all these ideas came, and so we became close friends. And she, uh -huh. she came to the hospital to visit me, and she got the church to pray for me. And she, she prayed, and, and uh, she didn't give up on me. And so I, I realized uh, then one of my roommates was named Sherry. Mm -hmm. And she spelled it the same way as my friend, C-H-E-R-I, uh -huh. which I think is an unusual way. Right. And she said to me one day, my roommate Sherry, she said, i got to go call my best friend Nancy. Oh, and that's when it started to click, you know, that God had gone before me to bring me this wow. friend wow. that I needed so badly that I would be in the hospital. And, need. and, and you know, Sherry, it was Sherry who um, found out that cause I was in the hospital quite a, a while, and they didn't know what to do with me. You know, they were just doing meds and, and talk therapy, and she found out that there was this um, electric shock therapy treatment that you could have. So that's what they did, and I guess that's that works against demons and, and wow. getting them out of you. Because I felt better after that, but I always thought it was, you know, that 
<laughs> the guy gone before me and provided this friend. So it was a combination of both, I guess. But, but he was at work all the time. Yes, he was there working. Even in the valleys, he's there. So, yep, that was um, God's grace. And I was free, but when I got out of the hospital, Zach got arrested for stealing from the job that he had. He kept losing jobs. And so John talked him into going into rehab. So Zach went to rehab in Pennsylvania, and he was doing really well until he got an attitude and said, you know, well, I'm just smoking marijuana, and other guys are doing hard stuff. You know, they need this position here more than I do. So, so he was basically just trying he, to... He broke the rules on purpose and ended up, they said, well, they took him to the bus station and said, you're out, you can't stay here, and you break the rules. So he called, he called John, but we were at our niece's wedding mm -hmm. in Virginia, so we couldn't, even if we wanted to, go get right. him. But we right. thought, well, this is a sign from God. And the rehab owner, he graduated from the same high school I did, the same year I did, mm -hmm. and I didn't know him in high school. And yet friends put us together with this man, and he had gone... He, he had gone through rehab when he was a teenager because he was a former drug addict. Mm -hmm. And then he started this rehab business to help other people. So that was a sign from God that you should follow his advice and mm -hmm. not Zach's, Zach's psychologist was saying, you can't leave Zach out on the street without his meds. But the rehab owner said, no, he's got to have consequences for his actions. You've mm -hmm. got to leave him out on the street. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we did. We left him out on the street for seven weeks, and, but John kept in contact with him and mm -hmm. we told him that we loved him. Mm -hmm. That's good. Because I, really, I was really scared. I, one of my therapists would say to me, well, just kick him out of the house if he's doing drugs. But my, my stepdad's son was doing drugs, and they kicked him out of the house, and he killed himself. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, it's better that he's doing drugs and alive <laughs> than to be dead. So. Right, right. So I mean, not trying, not laughing, but at the same time, just so I, I didn't kick him out of the house, and, and you let him stay, and you know, we saw these signs that God's saying he's got to have these consequences. Mm -hmm. So he, he did. He stayed out on the streets, and it was November and December by then, so it was getting pretty cold, and. He, it didn't seem to be working, though. He made friends with more homeless people and got food stamps, you know, and just went out and bought marijuana, mm -hmm. exchanged it for food stamps for marijuana. So, But he, he, it did affect him that he, he stopped stealing. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. said there were places that he could have, you know, taken money out of little ponds that they have coins for people, but he didn't do that. And he went to, he told him to go to a, a church and talk to a pastor, and right. he did that. And, and they, um, they got him in the programs. And anyway, God kept him safe. So at least he was listening part of the way, listening right. to you all. Right. But God kept him safe while he was on the streets. And when we finally, when Christmas was getting close and his birthday's in December, so we, we decided that we'd go get him and bring him home. And, and um, so we kept him in the detached garage because mm -hmm. I didn't trust him yet, and he had mm -hmm. to earn back my trust. Right. So that's what we did, and John got him a job working at a local diner doing the dishes. And mm -hmm. and then we, when he held that job for a while, we got him a, an apartment so he wouldn't have to live with us. And mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so, so, how, so how is he now? How is he now? What, well, <clears throat> God showed, God showed me slowly that when I was in the hospital, this, this woman flashed her chest to me and made a lewd suggestion. And so I reported her to the front nurse, and the, and the nurse said, well, she's not in her right mind. You know, and I thought, well, uh, she's probably just bipolar like Zach. And so that, that came back to my memory after Zach had been homeless and all, and, and I thought, oh. That's in the Bible, that, that term, not mm -hmm. in his right mind, and that story of, of Legion mm -hmm. being cast out into the pigs, right. and then the man was dressed and in his right mind. Mm -hmm. So that connection, the Holy Spirit reminded me that you know these are demons that mm -hmm. are just need casting out. He just needs deliverance prayers. Mm -hmm. 
Pastor John and I started looking into um, the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of tongues so that we could cast out these demons. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. We, we were, long, don't want to go into that long story. Right, but, right. But we, we received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the next time Zach came over, we cast out you know, the spirit of anxiety, a spirit of depression, the spirit of bipolar disorder, and any, anything else we thought was attacking him. Mm -hmm. And it worked immediately. He felt, felt a big difference. He went, God. he went to his doctor and he said, you know, I went off of these meds because I feel great. And his doctor says, well, what'd you do? And he said, we prayed. Praise God. That's what Zach told the doctor. Yeah, that's doctor. what Zach said. He told the doctor. Prayer. Praise God. Praise so God. Zach's not on any more medications and doesn't have any more episodes. Praise God. <laughs> Praise, Praise God. God. Yes. Praise God. Praise God. That's awesome. That's awesome. I tell you what, um, I know there's so much more, but uh, of course, <laughs> we have passed our time. But it was it was needful for you to get that out, to, to get that message, because I know that there are other people that are dealing with... Um, this this very same thing, and I and I tell you that I have uh, family members, you know, that deal with this same thing. So, um, and I and I pray also for their deliverance as well. But uh, praise God for you and and brother John, you know, staying with it, uh, praying for your son, interceding even as you were going through it yourself. Right. So so now God is using you both. Uh, to minister healing to people yes. and seeing seeing their healing. Right. You can't have a testimony without being tested. Yep. Right? That is true. That is true. Yeah. Wow. Well, Nancy, I, I, I appreciate you so much. Thank you so much for uh, sharing with the whole world because we don't know who God is going to have to look at this, mm -hmm. but I do know that uh, it's going to be a blessing and as a matter of fact, I decree and declare right now that this will bless God's people. It will bless those that don't even know Jesus. And, um, and, I, and I thank you that God will open up many, many, many doors for you and John as you continue being faithful to God as he has been faithful to you all. He so, will. Yes, sure definitely <laughs> so. Definitely. Well, thanks again. And thank you all for watching. And we will see you the next time on A Glorious Experience. Bye-bye.